Welcome everybody to the next iteration of the IITE seminar series. Today we have John DeLong here from the University of Nebraska and he's going to be talking to us about uh, some explorations of the evolution of functional responses. So without further ado, John, please, the floor is yours. All right, thanks so much, Georgi. Thanks everybody for showing up today. And thanks for the invitation, Georgi, to the series. And more than that though, thanks for making the series. Right, honestly, it's been fantastic tuning into these every couple of weeks. I have heard talks from people I've never met, right? It's really been fantastic to have. So uh, I really appreciate that you've done this, right? So I'm gonna talk about the uh, evolution of function responses, modify my title from the advertised title to just some explorations of the, right? Because that is what we're gonna do, right? There's a lot more we could do. All right, so let's start here. The basic building blocks of food webs are forging interactions. Right? Energy flows from lower trophic levels to higher trophic levels through the consumption of one individual by another. And in food web cartoons like this one, we summarize those interactions with these arrows. Right? So they represent species interactions, and they have demographic consequences for both predator and prey, and they're tracking energy flow across the system. So Understanding the structure, function, and dynamics of a food web like this one does, un does require us to understand what these arrows are about and how they uh, could be measured. And the main construct we use to understand those arrows is the functional response. Functional response is just a relationship between foraging rate or kill rate of a predator and the availability of a prey or several shapes one could consider this relationship, I'm just going to talk about this classic type 2 saturating functional response today that I can describe with a typical Holling disk equation here where the foraging rate per capita is a function of the prey availability R. And there are two key parameters. First one is, um, let's see, am I advancing? First one of those parameters is A, which is the slope of this curve as it goes through the origin. I'm going to call that space clearance rate. And the second one is H or handling time, which is the loss of search time um, in the event of actually capturing something. And that sets our azimuth. Well, you may notice if I, I have used the expression space clearance rate instead of the more familiar attack rate to describe A, and I'm gonna take a moment to tell you why. All right, so why space clearance rate? Right. Well, if we take our function response space, any line in this space has the slope has a slope of the rise over the run, right? And the units of that slope are gonna be the units of the rise over the run. So if we write that down, the units of the rise are prey per predator per time. The units of the, the run are prey per space, and that works out to actually space per predator per time. Right? So me mechanically, right, what that parameter represents is the uh, sum area or volume that a predator can completely clear of prey in a given unit of time. And then the foraging rate comes from multiplying that by the density of prey in that volume or area. Interestingly though, like this parameter has had a lot of names over the years. It's just a probably non-exhaustive list, right? Of different things that people have called this parameter through time. And they reflect a lot of different processes, right? So, you know, uh, people, Call it attack. So it has something to do with attack. It has something to do with success. It has something to do with searching and capturing an area. It has something to do with clearance and interaction strength. It has something to do with discoveries and detections, right? So, what is this parameter? Like, what does it have to do with? Well, the answer is yes. It has to do with all of these things, actually, right? Um, the space clearance rate and the whole functional response is, as we observe it and estimate it is a thing that emerges from all of these steps. This has been written down in several places, but recently there was a paper by Wooten et al. that did a nice job kind of um, walking through the sequence of steps and foraging interactions, right? In order for foraging to occur, a predator has to locate its prey, but has to search, right? It has to detect it to decide what to do if it does detect it, decide about pursuing and pursuing in some sort of way as part of its attacking, has to actually subdue it in some way and then eat it and then digest it even. All of these steps, right, occur. And then what we see on the other side, right, is foraging rate, and then we estimate these parameters. So um, 
the emergent sort of outcome, right, is this ability of a predator to clear space um, of its prey. And all of these steps, of course, can happen at some sort of rate or with some sort of probability, and they all take time. But just as importantly, right, they are all determined by underlying traits possessed by either the predator or the prey, or both in most cases. Right? So if we think about some kind of predator-prey interaction like that between lynx and hare, right, all of the steps in that sequence depend on traits like encounters between predators and prey, right, depend on traits that govern the movement, speed, and behaviors of lynx and hare. Detections are going to be determined by traits that govern the visual acuity or sensory ability of the lynx. Attacks are probably some sort of state-dependent um, variable that is related to physiological traits or other things. And then whether the attack is successful or the prey escapes is going to, again, be determined by traits that the hare possess that allow them to get away or traits that the lynx possess that allow them to complete the job, right? And then there are time costs with all of that. So there's a, a multitude of traits that are underlying this whole sequence of steps that emerge eventually as something we can observe as a functional response, where those traits are determining the values of space clearance rate and handling time, and not just those two parameters, but if you're thinking of other functional responses like predator-dependent ones, they would determine like interference parameters like wasted time or shape parameters like Q and a type three function response as well. And of course, all this means that, right, there are demographic consequences for both predator and prey. And so it's determining the death rate for our prey and the energy gain rate for our links here. So what that means is there's clear possibility that the traits that are determining all of these steps in the foraging sequence can be under selection because they have demographic effects via the functional response itself. So I tend to not think about space clearance rates and handling times or any of these other parameters as traits per se, but more like a process outcome. At the same time, right, you expect functional responses to evolve, but what's really evolving are some sort of trait underlying all of these sequences, um, underlying the sequence of steps, and not really something discrete like an A or an H. Um, yeah, so we can think about the evolution of space clearance rate and think of these A's and H's then as pseudo traits, you know, keeping in mind that they don't actually tell us what sort of underlying traits are changing. They just sort of telling us the direction that things might move in if they could. So with that, we can sort of turn to a simple expectation for the evolution of functional responses. And to me, it's fairly straightforward that evolution should generally just favor better predators and better prey. And a better prey is one that has a better predator is one that has a higher A and a lower handling time. Right? So a higher functional response all told, right? So greater energy gain at all prey levels. And a better prey should have a lower A and higher age, so a lower functional response and you know, lower risk of mortality at all prey levels. But, right, the world's a complicated place, right? Um, their predators themselves could be prey for something else. They could be competing. There could be habitats, you know, in the mix. There could be trade-offs that they're experiencing. So maybe there's a lot of nuance out there about our expect simple expectation about evolution generally favoring better predators or better prey. And that's kind of where this talk it came from, just trying to understand a little bit more nuance about our expectations for the evolution of functional responses. So with that, I have two parts here today. The first part is going to be trying to, trying to answer the question, how does increasing the number of prey types per se alter the evolution of space clearance rate? Right? And the second part is about coevolution, and there's two sub-questions there. First one is, like, does coevolution alter selection on space clearance rate right? relative to the single species evolution scenario? And then does coevolution of space clearance rate follow sort of classic paradigms of coevolution like arms races, red queen dynamics, or tug of wars? All right, so jump into part one here. How does increasing the number of prey types alter the evolution of space clearance rate? 
This is coming from recently published stuff um, in Oikos that I worked on with a postdoc in my lab, Kyle Coburns. All right, so to start with this part, we're gonna look at a fitness gradient here. And to do that, we're gonna start with half of a predator-prey equation here, right? A typical ODE predator equation where the consumer abundance changes with time according to a birth term and the death term. The death term is just this sort of base background constant rate of death. But our birth term, you know, comes from the functional response, right? Here's our hauling disk equation, everything subscripted for prey type one. And we have consumer abundance and then conversion efficiency, which is turning our consumed prey into new predator. Well, to get to our fitness gradient, we're going to divide through by C to give us the per capita rate of growth, which will then sort of rename mean absolute fitness for our population. And then take the derivative of that with respect to A, in sort of a typical quantitative genetics approach. And that's going to give us this business here. All right, so what is this again? This is the change in mean fitness with the change in A. Basically just says, how much better is my fitness if I change my A? And that's this business on the right. The first thing to notice is it's generally a positive number, right? And so, okay, it's better to have a higher A, right? just restating my better predator um, simple expectation. But it's also dependent on the amount of prey that's out there. It's dependent on A itself. So, at, at the very least, right, we might expect that um, increases in A would be sort of decelerating through time. And it's depending on dependent on handling time and conversion efficiency. So this is the one prey case. It's just, you know, we can have some general expectation. But what if there is a second prey in the mix? So now we'll just expand and do the same thing with two prey types. And this equation is the same here, except that I've just, you know, added the foraging for this prey type two, but I'm also paying the handling time cost for my second prey type two here. And we can go through those same steps and it gives you this business. All right, so the thing I want you to notice here first is that if the handling time of the two prey types is very similar, this whole numerator collapses to the same thing over there as it does in the first month of one prey type. But the denominator has this extra handle, this extra time paid still, and it's squared. So there's a real possibility that adding prey types can make the denominator relatively larger, which would shallow out the fitness gradient and slow evolution of space clearance. In fact, if you just keep adding prey types and keep doing this equation, it gets uglier and uglier, but it gives you the same kind of answer, right? Where essentially the fitness gradient just gets shallower and shallower the more prey types you add. And so that's what you can see here, prey species richness over here on the x-axis and our fitness gradient dropping quickly at first and then decelerating, but still going down. You can also see that the fitness gradient goes down as you increase prey abundance, right? which is uh, what you might expect also, if you go back to the equation, prey abundance is squared in the denominator, but linear in the numerator. So that should shallow that out. But this little analytical work gives us the, you know, sets a hypothesis for us, right? It suggests that whenever prey species richness is more diverse, we should see slower evolution of space clearance growth. So we wanted to explore whether that could show up in a simulation kind of approach. So that's what I'll tell you about now. And here's a model we use to do our simulation. It has a predator equation like the one I showed you, except now I'm kind of writing this out in the summation across all prey types I and the multi-species functional response. And I'm adding some wasted time to our functional response to stabilize the system a little bit. And it's, uh, um, yeah. There is an equation for each prey type I in the system, right, where I have their death, again, um, according to the functional response. Uh, and then there's this business here, right? All of this stuff that I'm kind of highlighting here with the um, laser pointer is actually just lockable Terra competition, right? Where there's uh, alpha there, competition coefficients among prey types. Um, but lockable Terra competition is built on the logistic model. And the log logistic model has an R max in it, 
And to do this simulation that we're going to do, we need to actually separate births from deaths. But we're going to use a simulation approach that has stochastic birth and death process. We can't do that if we just have R, right? So we have, instead of having just a density dependence of population growth rate, we have a density dependence of birth rates and then a density dependence of death rates. That's going to allow us to separate out births and deaths. Now, so what's going to evolve in this system, right? What's going to evolve is our space clearance rates A, and there's going to be a space clearance rate, a separate trait or parameter um, for each prey type in the system for our predator. So that could be um, quite a lot of evolving parameters there um, to keep track of. I mean, I parameterize this system overall, something reminiscent of essentially a small aquatic invertebrate eating algae. So it's going to be, uh, that's sort of the parameter space that we're operating. So instead of solving this model with ODEs and a bunch of equations for different A's, we're going to use uh, an approach called Gillespie Ecoevolutionary Models, or GEMS for short. And I'm going to give you the quick overview of that, so, but not the full sort of, you know, rundown on how those work. All right, so GEMS are built on the regular Gillespie approach that many of you are probably familiar with. It's a way of stochastically simulating an ODE. Um, and in a normal Gillespie approach, right, we have parameters that are constants, right, and that allows us to kind of do this business. But in a gem, the trait or parameter of interest right, is going to be a distribution. And as you cycle through the Gillespie algorithm, um, instead of always taking the same value for that parameter, you're going to draw randomly from this distribution. So what happens then is that every time you draw a trait that is more likely to lead to death, that trait gets pulled from the distribution and it moves the distribution away from that low fitness area towards higher fitness. And every time you draw a trait that increases the likelihood of a birth, you're going to bolster that part of the distribution and it moves itself towards higher fitness again. So what you end up with is a computational analog to natural selection has sort of built on this deterministic framework, has inherent demographic stochasticity, as well as genetic drift that can affect the outcome. And I can answer any more questions about how those work at the end if there's time. But we're going to use this GEM approach, simulate that equation I showed you, and this is what we have. All right. So we have four panels here. Time is on the x-axis of each of these. We have a space clearance rate on the y-axis. In all cases, they're standardized to the same starting value of zero, just as um, each of our runs started at a slightly different spot. And you can see what's happening in this one prey panel over here is that, yep, space clearance rate goes up and it's decelerating. And this um, solid line is our median outcome, and these shaded areas are the middle 50% of all of our runs. I've redrawn this pink line in the two prey, four prey, and eight prey um, plots. And what you can see is that these blue and yellow lines just get further and further below the pink line. So the answer to the first question is, yep, the uh, space clearance rate evolves more slowly when there are more prey types around in this simulation. Uh, but what's up with the yellow and the blue? Each of our prey types in these systems right, have different parameters. And so we sorted them based on the most rewarding and the least rewarding prey types and plotted them in different colors. And that sorting is based on the uh, ratio of the conversion efficiency to the handling time. So this is analogous to like an optimal foraging net energy gain kind of um, uh, metric, except it's more direct. It's about net births per time spent um, handling prey. And so and what you see is that the predators are actually evolving space clearance rates um, more quickly uh, for more rewarding prey than for less rewarding. But that separation is sort of disappearing when there's a lot of prey around. All right, so um, what, what does all that mean, right? <laughs> so the implications of that um, to me are that, well, whenever we have a diverse prey base, we shouldn't really expect a lot of change in space clearance rate after all, right? There's just the fitness gradient has been shallowed out and there's a little bit of change, but not a lot of change. And that could actually be a whole new mechanism for uh, predicting latitudinal gradients and interaction strengths, for example, 
where wherever in space there are more diverse communities, we should see um, generalist predators with weak interactions across the board, right? So maybe weaker interactions at lower latitudes and uh, stronger interactions at higher latitudes where there's less prey diversity and a greater pressure for predators to get good at um, foraging on what's around. But also at the same time, right, you know, in uh, less ability for predators to sort of evolutionarily distinguish good prey from bad prey. All right, well, I'll move on to um, part two here, coevolution of A. And this particular part is very much a work in progress. So I'm really interested to hear what people think about our setup and our answers, because we don't really know what it all means yet. Um, and once again, this is work that's going to be happening with uh, postdoc in my lab, Kyle Copeland. So let me go back to the fitness gradient and just kind of, you know, show this thing again. Showed this before, and it's the same thing. But I want to draw your attention to remind you that A is in the fitness gradient, which means that selection, further selection uh, for the change in A depends on the current value of A. And remember. A depends on traits held by both the predator and the prey. So if the predator and the prey are evolving at the same time, they're both having an effect on A. And so that could actually change the fitness gradient relative, uh, between the co-evolution scenario and the um, scenarios in which either predator or prey are evolving on their own. So first question we had was, is it any different, right? You would you see, you know, do you see the evolution of space clear and three any differently? in coevolution than otherwise. Uh, and then the second question we had is whether any of this coevolution sort of follows these sort of traditional paradigms of coevolution that you may learn about in ecology 101, for example, right? Um, classic paradigm of predator prey coevolution is the arms race, right? Where you have a predator evolves some kind of offensive weaponry. And then at that moment, right, the prey are under really steep selection to evolve defenses against that. And when they do, then the predator has to come back and sort of one up the prey in this sort of oscillating um, dynamic, right? And examples of that, you know, classic examples come from tox toxins and resistance to toxins, or the evolution of increased acuity or camouflage. Another paradigm is the red queen dynamics, which could be more or less the same thing as arms race um, types of dynamics, but with more emphasis on persistence, right? They're running to stand still kind of dynamic where evolution is essentially keeping both um, predator and prey in the system over time. An alternative to those is just a tug of war kind of paradigm where predator and prey are just sort of constantly under pressure to kind of get better at what they do and they're just pulling away from each other and their effects on the functional response of the rope is not really going anywhere. And then the fourth paradigm that we uh, came across is a sort of prey biased paradigm. This could be prey biased um, related to any of the above three, but the short version of that is just that if prey have shorter generation times than their pred predators, then they have an, an advantage, evolutionary advantage in real time, absolute time, because they can simply go through more generations and evolve defenses faster than the predators could evolve uh, offenses. We were interested to see if we could, um, our, uh, a simulation about coevolution would sort of indicate whether any of these paradigms are in operation. So we did a little thought experiment, a factorial thought experiment about where we might see these different kinds of things. And so I've broken out here a system with stable dynamics, like a fixed point equilibrium, Versus one with unstable dynamics, like uh, you know, uh, limit, limit, limit cycles or something like that. And then I've also broken it out with prey having long generation times or short generation times. And so if you go to this section here, you can imagine that a system that's stable where the prey have relatively slow um, or long generations, that maybe you just expect a tug of war dynamics, you know prey and the predator just pulling away from each other kind of in a balanced way. But if you shorten that generation time for the prey, it might tilt towards uh, being prey biased. And then we thought maybe we would see arms race types dynamics more likely in an unstable system 
right? Because in an unstable system, you're already going through periods of heavy predation risk and periods of light predation risk. So you're already introducing sort of oscillating um, selective pressure. And so maybe the um, evolution sort of map onto that and kind of respond to that pressure and you'd see your arms race more likely in those kinds of systems. And then we kind of threw red queen into this bin down here because maybe red queen dynamics would be more likely if the generation times of prey are short, but they have more opportunity for evolutionary rescue at that time, and that kind of system. <clears throat> All right, so to sort of answer those questions, we did another simulation where we're gonna look at compare coevolution to evolution of predator and prey on their own, and then see if we're seeing any kind of indications of any of these um, paradigms. All right, so once again, we have a model to do this, and it's again, uh, you know, fairly standard MacArthur Rosen's white type of model, again, with a wasted time parameter, predator dependence. And there's only one prey type in here, so it's not multi-species functional responses. And once again, I have broken out our logistic equation into a density-dependent birth and a density-dependent death rate so that we can have stochastic birth-death dynamics. Now, to map onto our thought experiment, I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to vary, vary, vary the wasted time parameter. So I can pick a parameter, a wasted time parameter that allows fixed point equilibrium and then in, um, reduce it and it'll turn it into something with cycles. So I can hold everything constant and turn my stable system into an unstable one by changing one thing. And then I'm gonna do the same thing by changing the values of Vmax and Vmin. Remember that Rmax is equal to the difference between Vmax and Vmin, right? And it's, but it's Rmax that determines the growth dynamic. So I can change the values of D max and D min without changing R max. So I can hold the whole thing constant. And if I have a high value of D max and D min, I have a lot of turnover. In other words, I have short generation times. And if I have a low value of D max and D min, I have a low turnover. In other words, long generation times. So in this way, I can sort of do my factorial experiment, keeping everything else constant. Um, to parameterize this, we fit it to some lynx hair cycles, right? So that once again, we at least we have a system that's reminiscent of something that could occur in nature. And we're going to allow um, space clearance rate to evolve. But in this case, we're going to allow it to evolve for predator, prey, or both at the same time. And uh, in the case where in the realized value of A in the system that's governing the dynamics is going to be the geometric mean between the predator and the prey A values at any given moment. All right, we're gonna do that with gems again <clears throat> so that we can just allow traits to evolve without having to write down equations for them. And this is what we get. All right, so a bunch of panels here, so I'll walk you through them. So the first column is the no evolution scenario. It's just kind of a check here for us. The second column is a predator evolves on its own. Third column is the prey evolves on its own, and then the final column, the predator and the prey are co-evolving. This top row is our space clearance rate trajectories, and this bottom row is our abundance trajectories. So you can see um, when in the no evolution one, nothing happens with our traits, that's good. Um, in our abundances, though, you see this dashed line is our ODE solution, solution for the deterministic underlying model there. You can see it gives us a fixed point um, equilibrium. <clears throat> but with the stochasticity, we end up with a little resonance around that and a little bit of a wee bit of deviation there, which I don't think is that big a deal. But um, when we move over to allowing the predator to evolve, you can see it takes off really fast. Right? They are evolving a higher space clearance rate. And the consequence of that is both predator and prey populations decline a little bit. When we allow the prey to evolve on their own, of course, it gets smaller. Um, not as much smaller as the prey gets larger. Um, and that, of course, brings the abundances of both populations up. Um, and in the coevolutionary scenario, they both go in essentially the same way that they did before. And this kind of creates an intermediate dynamic. This yellow dashed line is just replotting the line from the single species scenario. So you can see that dashed line is just kind of going through our noise on the coevolutionary scenario. 
And so what, you, you know, answer number one is, nope, there was really no difference between the co-evolution scenarios and any of the scenarios where the prey and predator were evolving on their own. Maybe that makes sense, right? Maybe that's because, well, the actual sort of impact of that, of co-evolution is to pull A in opposite directions. And if it's not really changing much as a result, then it's not really, shouldn't really be any different. But uh, we kind of thought it would be different. <laughs> um, you also can see that they really are just uh, moving away from each other, right? It's just, this is what I call sort of classic tug of war without any real sort of um, funny business happening. And I'm sorry, I didn't think I said this. This is the short generation time in the stable dynamics um, version. If we just make the, the generation times longer, it pretty much does the same thing. Right? It's just a little less noisy because there are fewer events occurring through time and, uh, with less turnover. But again, just sort of a tug of war dynamic where co-evolution is not much different than non-co-evolution. If I compare those two co-evolutionary scenarios, right? Um, we can look at, uh, here's the prey and the top panels and the predator on the bottom panels. The space clearance rate trajectories are on the left and the abundance trajectories are on the right. What we thought was that the shorter generation times would allow prey to evolve more quickly and give them an advantage. Um, but um, the short dashes here are short generations and the uh, long dashes are the long ones. And you can see there's really not much difference there that didn't really have that effect. Um, but weirdly, uh, it had another effect we didn't expect, right? We, there is this resonance in the system, right? These quasi cycles that occur through stochasticity that I don't honestly understand. Um, but there are more, there is more of this resonance when the generation times are shorter. Maybe that seems intuitive because there's more opportunity for events to kind of generate stochasticity. Um, but I'll make a quick shout out to the group Right, I don't get resonance, right? <laughs> if there's somebody else out there, out there who does get resonance, that would be a great topic for one of these seminars. Uh, so moving on, uh, here's our short unstable scenario. Um, once again, here's our no evolution panel. You can see we have these cycles here and our stochastic abundance cycles are kind of following that, so that's good. And the predator, of course, goes, um, evolves a higher space clearance rate and the prey evolves a smaller one. But it's way noisier, right? which is something maybe we'd expect because the dynamics are quite a bit noisier. But when the predator evolves in the unstable system, they pretty much go extinct all the time. So uh, an evolutionary suicide kind of. When the prey evolves, right, that is reversed and the predators persist. Um, and then in the co-evolutionary system, you see once again, kind of a, an intermediate outcome um, where once again, the uh, co-evolution scenario doesn't look a lot different from the non-co-evolution scenarios. And there isn't a whole lot of cycling of the trait evolution that maps on to these dynamics like we thought there might be if it was showing an arms race kind of thing. Instead, it looks just like a really noisy tug of war. If we make the, the, uh, the generation times long again, we still get the same kind of outcome overall, um, just a wee bit less noise. I'm going to just compare those co-evolution ones again. Again, we were predicting some prey bias when um, generation times were slower, and we really didn't get that. But we would expect this short dash lines to be you know, more quickly dropping um, than the long one, but it wasn't the case. But the other sort of weird thing that emerged from this contrast is that in the short generation um, scenario, the predators survived better. There was less extinction than in the long generation time. And this isn't really Red Queen. Like I think of Red Queen as, okay, evolution is going to benefit the evolving population, right, at some level. But in this case, this is evolution of the prey benefiting the predator, right? So I wouldn't, I would, I feel like that's something different. Maybe that's White Queen dynamics. I don't know. Um, but it wasn't what we really expected. All right, so um, again, like this is a work in progress. I'm interested to hear your thoughts. We don't really know what all this means yet. But that brings me to the end here. Um, so in the very beginning, I uh, talked about function responses as being this sort of process outcome, right? Um, and those parameters aren't really traits, but they reflect a lot of traits. 
we can sort of think about them changing the pseudo traits, um, but not necessarily telling us what sort of physical traits are changing within any given system. We have a simple expectation of you know, evolution should just favor better predators and prey, but in part one, we saw that whenever um, prey diversity was higher, that that didn't really happen so much. It only happened a little bit. And I only went to eight prey types, right? So a lot of prey predators have many more prey types in their diets than that, suggesting that very broadly, right? There should be very little pressure for predators to get particularly good at eating anything and just kind of maintain weak interactions across the board. Even so, whenever prey are, types are a little less diverse, you can see that they, they can um, uh, evolve to be better at foraging on more rewarding prey types. And then in the second part, right, we were expecting maybe some differences in the evolution of space clearance rate during a coevolutionary scenario, and there just wasn't any. Even when we kind of messed with it a little bit by you know, making the dynamics unstable or stable or changing the generation time of the prey, it all just kind of pointed to a tug of war dynamics that wasn't any different than predator or prey evolving on their own. Um, and there really wasn't any evidence of red queen arms race or prey favored outcome, outcomes at all. So with that, right, I'd just like to thank some of my funding sources here that have helped support all this gem development and several people who have over the last few years really helped me put together um, gems and made them work. Um, and so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk about that. Thank you so much, John. Uh, as usual, if you have a question, please uh, click the raise hand button and I will call on you. So are there any questions? Questions? Yes, Chrissy, please go ahead. Okay, hi. Um, so I thought this was really, really interesting. Um, and I was curious about the first section where it seemed like you were kind of taking a um, like a consumer or predator perspective on it, right? By like mm -hmm. focusing on um, the evolution using an equation based on the consumer uh, per capita growth yeah. rate, right? And I was just curious if you think you would get like a very different outcome. What if you had like, what if you focused on one prey type and you had multiple consumers um, oh. and you kind of flipped around that first study, would, would that change things? And like kind of trying to think about like the constraints on, right? Like when you talk about prey types, are they like quite different from each other? And then anyway, yeah. I, I have like a bunch, my brain is going in multiple <laughs> directions. So I'll let you answer that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, the last question is the easiest one. Like, um, we sort of imagine prey types as species, but I don't necessarily, you know, think that they would have to be, right? Um, the way we parameterize the system, right? We each prey type was had parameters that were drawn from the distribution, so they were all different, but not like radically different. Um, and this is sort of in a more general problem of thinking about like, you know, predators as generalists or specialists, like you know, something that's in there, you know. They may specialize because they have morphologies that limit what they can and can't eat. But within that, it seems like they could, you know, they kind of maybe eat anything they want, right? So um, the boundary conditions were, were like that, right? They had the ability to eat everything in the pool that we created, um, but each prey type was at least quantitatively different in terms of the parameters that they started with. But then the second question, the first question was about, you know, uh, turning the tables around and asking about prey evolution under risk from multiple predator types, if I understood you correctly. Um, what would happen there? I don't know. Um, I feel like that would, if you could even, I guess if maybe you had a lot of prey types in the mix, I think that the If you, as you added predator types, I think the risk of predation gets so high, like it might even be difficult to have a system where the prey even survive long enough to, um, to go anywhere. But if you could put that together, 
um, maybe you added a lot of interference or something so the predators could just never get that good at eating anything. Um, what would they do? I suppose that they would just move away in all, you know, in all of their contributions to the space clearance rate. Um, but would it get any steeper if there were more predators? No, I guess we're just going to have to do it. To answer the question. <laughs> Sorry, I may be a cop out, but I'm not sure really. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, and uh, Axel, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Thank you for the talk. Very, very interesting to see how this works in individual based models. The, you know, there is this review by Peter Adams on the evolution of predator prey interactions from 2000. He, he looks Abrams? at it more from a Peter Abrams, yes. He looked at it more yeah. from, from analytics here, but there's lots of work that he kind of put together. It may mm -hmm. be interesting to, to kind of relate to that and how your approach differs or not differs from, from what they have worked out. But they, I, my, my comment is different. There is this thing called the, what people use for functional responses, the common sense condition. And, and it, it says, if you split- I'm Sorry, you broke up a little bit there. Could you say that again? Okay. If, you, if you split one population into two that, have, that are functionally equivalent, mm -hmm. so like one have a little dot somewhere um, on the nose and the others don't or so, <laughs> right. then, then um, nothing should change, right, really? And, and in your case, obviously the evolution rate goes, cuts, is cut in half. And I think the reason is that in reality, if the attack rate on one species increases, then the attack rate on the other species would also increase. So they, they are not independent. The, 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 and so what I would be doing is um, parameterize my attack rate in terms of trophic traits, traits of prey and predators, and then evolve these trophic traits. And then, then this problem wouldn't necessarily arise because then the the, um, yeah. So um, I'm not sure I fully understood, but um, yeah, the reason why they go down is because by eating more of other things, you pay more handling time. I, I thought it, I you pay thought more handling reason. time. You move to a place where the 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 steepness of the functional response mm -hmm. is less relevant. I think that's that's one of the things. There is more to eat, so there's more handling time. The other thing is that that the, 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 the times you encounter one prey is less because you eat both. The frequency of right. and so and so you have less trials to test your new new attack rate, and therefore the evolution is slower. Right. So counters can change if you change the total abundance. Uh, we actually held the total abundance constant and mm. divided it up. Right. So, um, so the uh, abund abundance of cause. each of each prey is only is cut by half. If I have two prey, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. The, if you have two prey species, then the abundance of each prey species is cut by half, or not? Yeah. Right. And then you have less encounters with this other prey, and that's so. Then you the still the rate. predator still has the same total encounter rates. Mm. Right. And, and so then, then yes, then if these, these attack rates are totally independent, yes, then they evolve slower because you have less chance to test them. But, but if, they are, if they're coupled, then you can get the same speed as before. Mm. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if there, is there a question that I should respond to or? Uh... No, that was a comment. Okay, all right, yeah. Uh, well, one of the challenges in getting started in this was deciding like kind of what to allow to change mm. and right, like how to set it up, obviously, right? Mm. You could- It's, it's very tricky. You could make things more connected um, uh, or less connected. Like we were trying it out, like allowing prey, um, prey abundance to increase, um, allowing prey abundance to not increase, right? We even changed it from a system in which the competition coefficients were neutral, meaning mm. all one, or where they were more like niche based. And these things had like no effect on our outcomes. Which is a surprise that's a lot. I, I really imagined that the like the way prey types uh, competed with each other would affect abundances more and affect the um, outcome more. But I think the the movement from kind of the steepness of that drop and fitness gradient was just too high and just kind of like dominated. 
that effect. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes, Henry, please go ahead. Okay, sorry. Hi, thank you for thank you for the talk, John. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I, I always start from George Box's dictum that all models are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, I don't really believe in the functional response. It's a, it's a very high level summary and, and um, averaging out of things. And yeah. I think of, of you know, animals growing up, um, uh, maybe at different stages, they get predated by some predators and other stages by others. Mm -hmm. Maybe they escape predation in one way. Is there's the clumping effect? Um, um, I, you know, a lot of the a lot of the um, images that you were using were predators that I was were operating schools or prey that get clumped either just by ocean currents or by mm -hmm. actual activity, and all of these actually very very strongly change the the values of of these generalized averages that you're calling the clearance rate and the handling time even. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's difficult for me to actually believe that um, I, I, I find it interesting to look at the, at the curves and the responses and, and of the model system, but I find it difficult to relate the model system to the real world. Mm. Right. Well, that's always a challenge with theory. And, you know, that's uh, probably, you know, uh, something we should all spend a lot more time thinking about, right? How our models uh, reflect the real world, right? Um, which is why, you know, in both cases, we tried to parameterize it in a way that looked like something in, the, in nature. That second one, you know, we we're able to recapture, you know, the dynamics of Link's hair in that model. And so that's a, at least a starting point that it occurs in parameter space that is potentially real. Right? Um, but the first thing you said was uh, you don't believe in the function response, which is interesting. And I think after what I heard you say after that is that I'm guessing what that what you really mean is you don't believe that mass action governs interactions. Is that right? Oh, you're muted. Sorry, Henry, you're muted. I, I don't think mass action uh, um, actually is, is as important as we would like it to be given the easy equations we get. Right, right. So yeah, so when you say I don't, you know, the, uh, a lot of things don't really move in a way that looks like Brownian motion, right? <laughs> Probably, right, don't move that way. Um, and so, you know, there's a, you know, a flaw in the construction of the derivation of, um, of the function response. Uh, and yeah, I think that's true. I think, don't think anything really, like maybe bacteria, I don't know, um, have Brownian motion, right? But most things have, uh, are more directed motion than that mm -hmm. uh, or occur in groups. So it is it's always been a little surprise to me that you know, a lot, a lot of data like look like a type two function response, right? So there's still an issue there where, you know, capturing something fundamental, but maybe the, maybe the route to getting to that equation could be different if you count mm -hmm. for it. And, you know, you could do it without I, necessarily assuming mass action. Yeah, I, I would rather say that, you know, when you have, when you want to generalize, you can say that, there's a tendency which overall more or less happens, but when you look at detailed cases, it isn't like that. It's it's a collective right. thing that emerges. Right. Um, Bas Guiman has the interesting comment that only the type two Holling functional response composes to another function of the same type. Because I was also thinking of um, what, what um, Andre Morozov has shown that your parameter estimates is very sensitive 
to what kind of saturating curve you choose, whether you use mm -hmm. a, um, you know, he, he had three examples, but you can have more curves which go through the origin and, and have a asymptote. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be Holling too. That's right. There are other there are other models that even have this relatively similar shape, right? Um, look what look can look like the data. Mm -hmm. um, that's but true. then when you when you use them to fit the models, you get very very different sensitivities and parameter values. Yeah, I'm, and I think that's kind of where I'm coming from when I was talking about what are we supposed to understand these parameters to mean, right? They're emergent properties, right? They're, they're not traits, right? They are telling us about, they don't actually tell us what caused them. You know, they're just kind of saying that if you add everything together, this is the way foraging looks in this particular system, right? Um, yeah, so they, they talk about your, your model, what they say about the real world is open, I think. Well, that's a good question. Wait, what do our people say about the real world, right? You know, um, most of the function response data we have don't come from wild situations, but from laboratory scenarios. And it's hmm. rather challenging to measure them in, in nature. Very right? much, yeah. The, uh, you know, it's possible to measure a foraging rate here and there, right? But then you have to have a prey density um, to go along with that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is, you know, I totally agree with you. You know, there's there's always a disconnect between theory and the real world, right? Um, but to the extent that you have captured something, you know, that is observable, right? Uh, you can then at least move forward, right? Even if you don't necessarily, you haven't necessarily completely captured everything that went into that observation. Mm. I have to say maybe. Maybe. <laughs> thanks anyway. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, OK, thank you. Uh, Sami, please go ahead. OK, hi. Thanks, John, for a very interesting talk. and. Um, I have a question about the coevolution and especially about the evolution of the prey. And uh, I have to say, I got a bit confused when um, it seems like uh, both the evolution of the prey and the predator are affecting the same parameter, the uh, space mm -hmm. clearance rate A. So um, I got a bit confused. What does it mean, like in terms of the um, uh, selection on the individual level, since it's not like um, they are, um, it's not like it's the same trait that's evolving, but it right. appears to like uh, the clearance rate is like um, some kind of an emergent property of the of the evolving traits. So, um, have you considered trying to kind of um, construct the model mechanistically so that they will be actually um, a more clarity in, in in that what is the evolving trait and how does it affect the um, clearance rate instead of the clearance rate being the evolving trait, right? Uh, as it is here. Yeah, we we have thought about that. In fact, we started originally doing that, right? Um, but the thing that sort of got in the way was that every time, like. Once you break that space clearance rate down, you know, into sub functions and equations that have to add up to the A, you just start adding more and more assumptions. And then you have to keep adding more and more parameters. And, you know, it got to the point where like, well, I just feel like I'm, the whole thing is now a house of cards because any, you know, I could do anything here and um, I could change, I could pick a, I could pick velocity or visual acuity or all of these things. And I just felt like I made so, was making too many choices, right? Um, that I, uh, and it was feeling less and less general, right? So I gave up <laughs> uh, on that path. And I was like, just let me go back to the most 
the most basic way I could possibly think of, of doing this. And that was yeah. just kind of reverting to, you know, saying predator and prey both have a contribution to this parameter. So let me just give them each a parameter. And the contribution comes, and I may not have explained this very well, but um, as you go through, like there has to be an actual, there has to be one number that governs, you know, the probability of mortality um, in the model at any given moment. And so that number at any given moment was the geometric mean of the predator and prey that are engaged in that particular um, step in the algorithm. So I just had that, you know, I'm like, okay, so maybe the prey have a really small, you know, number and the predator have really small numbers to take the geometric mean. And now that's determining um, the outcome. So they both have a contribution. Um, but I, you know, the specific thing that is evolving that was causing that contribution, I just decided to drop. Um, although I, I totally completely, I totally agree with you that it'd be, uh, to get to a more uh, cleaner system, like if I actually knew anything about links and hair, right? Um, maybe I could break them down and you know kind of pair that with the fit to the their cycles that do something more meaningful there. But def definitely, I would put it uh, on the list of things to do. Yeah, it's like they say, it's you should keep your model as simple as possible, but uh, not too simple. And finding the balance is uh, magical. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, are there other questions? While people are thinking, I might have a couple of questions. Uh, one question I had was about the time scales, uh, because. Uh, well, I guess the time units weren't either were either standardized or not specified, but uh, it looked like the population dynamics happened on on the exact same time scale as the evolution. So it's some very very rapid evolution. Mm -hmm. I'm also wondering what would happen if we would wait a bit more. Would those strongly increasing curves saturate after a while, or would something happen? Um, I think they would saturate after a while, at least, at least decelerate. I don't know, you know, if they would ever, I don't think they would properly asymptote unless they ran out of genetic variation or something like that. Um, the, the time scale on the evolution one was specified by the, the dynamics that we fit. And so those were years. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't remember what they were in the invertebrate one um, we were using was probably like days or something. Mm -hmm. I, I guess one question is, w w does one get something radically different or pretty much the same if we, in, in the gem algorithm, just make the distributions narrower, sort of slow down evolution so that mm -hmm. there is at least a bit of a semblance of a time scale separation between uh, ecology and evolution? Yeah. Absolutely. If you change the, um, the, the variance in those traits or that level of heritability, right, um, you can very quickly speed up or slow down the rate of change in those parameters. Um, I don't remember what I used. I think we, our default is usually like a heritability of, um, or a coefficient of variation in a parameter or a trait of around 0.2. Mm -hmm. And then ability somewhere between 0.5 and like 0.7 or something, um, which is actually probably too heritable in many cases, but for some traits, it's not, you know, a lot of things have been measured would have heritability in there. How difficult, um, just wondering, how difficult are these simulations to, to repeat? By that, I mean how time consuming. So is it easy to check what happens with lower heritabilities? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, they take time to run. <laughs> um, you know, uh, yes. it's, if you've ever played with the Gillespie, they, you know, it, it's the time that it takes is very strongly dependent on the number, the size of the populations. Yeah. Um, and so we try to kind of balance that out, have big enough populations that, um, 
that everything isn't just noise or going extinct, but it isn't taking weeks to run, right? So these particular ones, you know, maybe four or five hours per set of, you know, per set of things, right? So I offload them to a cluster, you know, to, to run. Um, so, you know, definitely possible to redo them and slow everything down, right? Mm -hmm. um, or speed everything up. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Are there any questions in the meantime? No. Then I guess I'll ask the unfair and obvious question uh, of <laughs> how does this all change if we add in a top level? Ah, <laughs> well, it's totally fair, right? <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, this is where, was it Sammy's question, I think is really important, right? Um, because what your predator does in response to its own risk is going to affect its own functional response, right? Uh, so you, I think that there you would have to make a connection. Like, and the thing that you know that always comes into my mind is that well, if 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 I'm hunting, I'm exposed, right? And so um, if I don't want to die, I should be less exposed, which means I should move less or something like that which means that I um, encounter fewer prey items myself, right? So I feel like they ought to be connected in such a scenario, um, which means that I can't, well, maybe I can connect them just with A's, um, but it, you know, maybe it, you need to break it down a little bit more and try to understand how like a specific behavior would affect both sides. Sort of in the manner that you were showing in the beginning? of the water yeah exactly breakdown mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right right so my encounter rate like that's the one that i think i think that's a that's a big part of all mm -hmm. of this mm -hmm. like, what do i do that allows me to run into my prey um and then whatever i'm doing uh, at the same time i have to think about not running into my predator or maybe even my competitors and so that encounter those traits are probably the key ones thank you yeah I don't know, yeah. uh, are there any questions? Uh, yes, Chrissy, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I was curious, I was thinking about like terrestrial versus aquatic food webs and the differences in like, just how predators would move around or how we think about like often in the ocean we think about um prey choices being based on gape size you can't mm -hmm. really like drag around or like guard a carcass in a right. lot of like aquatic spaces so like a plankton food web you know you have they're like moving around in the same parcel of water and you're just kind of browsing but it's 3d and then you have, mm -hmm. you know, the links and hairs where it's more of a 2D space, but you have more ability to hide. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about like how that affects th this like emergent property of A. Like, is it more useful in, cause like I'm biased towards aquatic food webs thinking about like, oh, well, I think like functional responses like pr work pretty well for plankton communities like that makes sense to me they're like browsing around and if you're talking about on a relatively small scale like seems okay um but yeah but i don't know as much about how we think about uh those behave foraging behaviors and 2d versus 3d space in in terrestrial ecosystems right um well, this is an area I think people have been starting to think more about, right? Like the actual sort of biomechanics of detection and encounter rates, right? In particular, right? And you probably have all seen that paper by Samrat Pawar um, that looks at the you know two D and three D um, interactions, and they kind of help you know uh, they show that you know, or, or say it like this they they write down how like like detections and sort of uh, of prey by predators, you know, has its own dimensionality, right? So, you know, you're, if you're a link running around, you're, you're looking in a plane, mm -hmm. right? 
But if you're, you know, some, I don't know, uh, fish, you know, you're looking maybe more in a cone, right? So you have actual different dimensions to your, um, to your searching and right off the bat, that's probably gonna change the magnitude of everything, right? Or the way you encounter stuff. And so I, I do think there are gonna be fundamental differences that way. And, um, but even also in, on land, right? Aerial insectivores are, are you know, um, hunting aerial plankton, right? And then even in more sort of non-integer habitats like plants, right? Um, where they, you know, things are searching along these sort of connected sets of lines, right? I think all of those things are, uh, so that dimensionality thing I, I think is probably, is really important and not resolved in my mind as like what you should really expect to be different. Um, I don't really have an answer for you and like how it should be resolved, but uh, um, it's probably worth noting that, right, you know, uh, Space clearance rate has different units in you know 3D versus 2D environments, so you can't really even compare them directly. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Well, well thank you. Think... Plot, right? You can't. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, thank you. It's been really interesting. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? There are no more questions then thank you again john and thank you everyone for your attention and Thanks, everyone. Uh, we shall see see you thank you john and and uh, we'll hope to see you all in two weeks for the next seminar take care everyone bye-bye <laughs>